both the history department here at UH and the Center for Public History uh, for supporting this event. If you're interested in more events like this, there is a yellow legal pad floating around. If you'd like to add your name and your email at, uh, address to that, we'll let you know about events that are coming up in the fall. Uh, we plan to give a healthy dose of the ancient world to our community here at UH. So our speaker today is Dr. Rebecca Benefiel, Associate Professor of the Department of Classics at Washington and Lee University. Dr. Benefiel holds a PhD from Harvard University with additional graduate study at La Universita di Roma, La Sapienza. <laughs> she is co-editor of Inscriptions in the Private Sphere and the Greco-Roman World and has authored a wealth of articles on ancient inscriptions. Her approach to ancient graffiti in particular has captured a very wide audience, uh, having been featured in Smithsonian Magazine, National Geographic, NPR, and most recently, The Atlantic. Today, Dr. Benefiel will be speaking both on ancient graffiti and her digital approach within her work. She's a leading expert in this intersection, acting as a contributor to the Europeana network of ancient Greek and Latin epigraphy, supervisor for the epigraphic database Roma, and director of the Ancient Graffiti Project, the project which has been funded both by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and, just recently, a major 2016 NEH Digital Humanities Startup Grant. So all in all, I think it's very fair to say that Dr. Benefield brings a tremendous wealth of knowledge and experience to both our ancient and digital communities here at UH. She's also kindly offered to answer any and all questions you might have on either at the end of her talk today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rebecca Benefield. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Can you all hear me? All right. Great. Um, I'm. I have this microphone, but it's not actually amplifying anything for you, so I'm going to try and maintain a nice equilibrium so that you all can hear me and this can be recorded as well. Thank you so much for that introduction. I am so happy to be here. Um, I actually, there are people here who I've met at different points in my life, so it's wonderful for the chance to see them. And my uncle taught here at the University of Houston a while back in the School of Communication. So, Already, for decades, the University of Houston has uh, meant fun, fun things to me. So thanks very much for having me here. And I'm sorry that the only thing I was not aware is that Fridays, I should wear red. Um, so here we go. Um, hopefully, everyone has, uh, or if you would like and don't have, I have a handout so that if you get really interested in um, ancient inscriptions, there are plenty of other places to go. That's for later. Just a, a takeaway, a take home uh, surprise. All right. Well, today I'd like to talk about some of the challenges involved in building a digital humanities project and how we, my team, has approached these challenges. And I will be introducing you to ancient graffiti, a little known but fascinating corpus of material, which is the subject of our project. Right up, I would like, right up front, I would like to emphasize three ideas. Teamwork, feedback, and collaboration. Teamwork, feedback, and collaboration. These are the keys to the success that we've had so far. So, here we go. All right. This view into a small room in Herculaneum might not seem to offer much of interest. The inner core of some walls, a bit of plaster, right? but it's ancient. Um, <laughs> but if you were to move closer and look carefully, you might start to notice that there's some scratches on that bit of plaster. And if you spent time deciphering those scratches, you would find a message written out. So I'll tell you, we've got a name. Good, people are already <laughs> chuckling. If you've ever taken Latin and learned the dirty words, you're getting this. Anyway, <laughs> Apollinaris the doctor of the Emperor Titus. Here, did some verbal action well. <laughs> now what's interesting is this is a cultural artifact. This is a piece of Roman culture. And sometimes when you approach cultural artifacts, you're gonna learn more about your own culture than the one you're looking at. I say this as an American, and you notice I have not translated that word, kakawit. We had a team two years ago 
who were contributing translations to a, a big project. And our team was international, so we were translating um, Latin into English and German and Swedish and Chinese, actually. Um, and of course, the Americans, we had about five different euphemistic ways of saying made caca. Um, whereas the Germans said, I don't understand. There is only one way to translate this. Apollinaris hat hier gut geschissen. <laughs> and so, so if the Germans only have one way to translate it, maybe the Romans did too, but of course we Americans are a little, uh, you know, we've got the Puritan background with us. So anyway, but what, so getting beyond our initial reaction, um, what we have here is Someone, we have the doctor of the Roman emperor visiting a house in a small town on the Bay of Naples. Titus became emperor in the year 79, the same year that the volcano that loomed right above Herculaneum exploded and destroyed the town where this was found. So we have a time frame for this message. And although our tendency might be to focus on that second line, when we look, at the inscription itself, we can see that the first line is written in larger letters. And so the person writing it is giving more attention to the identity and the position of Apollinaris, the Roman imperial doctor. Lastly, when we consider the location where it appeared, one of the grandest and best positioned house, houses in the city, directly on the coast of the Bay of Naples, with a fabulous panorama looking out over the Gulf, we can recognize that that's exactly the type of place where the emperor or his retinue would be visiting if they were to visit a small town. So these are some of the observations that can be made from ancient graffiti if we study them carefully and if we have the chance to consider content, appearance, and context. Now at present, with material that's available, that's quite difficult to do but we're trying to make it more possible with our development of the Ancient Graffiti Project, which is a digital resource for studying the ancient handwritten inscriptions of Pompeii and Herculaneum. So here we go, that's what it looks like. My plan for today is first to introduce you to Roman graffiti. What do ancient graffiti tell us? Who's writing them? Who's the audience? I'll also discuss how difficult it can be to turn these first century handwritten spontaneous writings into a manageable data set. Then I'll discuss how we have designed our project with the goal of making these ancient inscriptions more accessible and user-friendly. Finally, I have a few observations to share about developing a digital humanities project, demonstrating how we have grown AGP from prototype through archeological fieldwork to the version 2.0 that we have today. Everything is always under development, so we still, it's, it's looking pretty good, but there's a long way to go. Um, and here I'll just remind you, Teamwork, feedback, collaboration. So first, some background. Only three locations across the world have yielded caches of handwritten documents from the Roman Empire. You might be able to guess Egypt with its papyri, Vindolanda in Britain, where discoveries of wooden tablets have shined light on life on the edges, on the frontier of an empire, and then of course, Herculaneum and Pompeii in central Italy, um, where wall plaster has yielded thousands of examples of individual writing in public buildings and in private homes. While it's possible to protect papyri and wooden tablets by moving them to a climate controlled environment, however, the wall plaster that holds our writings is a fragile service in an open air location constantly exposed to the elements. By fully documenting these writings now with non-invasive techniques, we aim to save and preserve as much as possible and to provide access to this material to a wide network of scholars and students. Why do we even have all this great stuff from Pompeii and Herculaneum? Well, there we go. <laughs> um, this is a bit of a dramatic rendition of it. Um, we know from Pliny's letters that it was actually pretty dark, but if I just showed you a dark screen, well, this is, this is more evocative, right? Um, so, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the year 79 AD devastated the surrounding regions with volcanic debris raining down for multiple days and eventually burying the towns of Herculaneum and Pompeii. 
This gives you a sense of the way the, the wind was blowing. So you can see Herculaneum, which is really right at the foot of the mountain, Pompeii, which is further away, um, and that's kind of the ash fall. You see where we are in central Italy. We have an ancient author who says that ash from the eruption of Vesuvius reached as far as Egypt. Archaeologically, we know it reached as far as southern Italy, but it did, uh, but it did really effectively blot off the face of the map, Herculaneum and Pompeii. And in fact, uh, the emperor sent down a kind of rescue team to assess the si situation, and they decided, no, we just had to abandon. There was nothing to be saved, Herculaneum and Pompeii. So Herculaneum, located right at the foot of the mountain, here we go, um, endured pyroclastic surges and temperatures of up to 400 degrees Celsius. So um, if you can see, this is what I was going to do. Let's see if, uh, there we go. So this is this pyroclastic debris which covered all of Herculaneum and then turned into rock. So it's very hard to excavate. Um, we have about 80 feet of it surrounding Herculaneum. So when we do excavate, we have multiple stories, multiple levels at Herculaneum, which we don't have at Pompeii. Pompeii, we essentially have the floor plan of, of everything. Um, so what they discovered in excavations in the early 2000s, this is a section of the Villa of the Papyri, which maybe you've heard of, and the Getty Museum out in Malibu is, is built on the plan of the Villa of the Papyri. And so when they um, did some excavations here, they found out that we've got at least three levels we only knew about one level that had been um, explored in the 1700s, but now we know there were at least three levels, maybe four, to this massive, extensive villa that's just, just outside the city walls. Um, that heat flash-fired organic matter, resulting in the preservation of material like carbonized wood. As you see here, this is the house of the wooden screen because this is first century wood. Um, and this was a screen that could be closed to, to close off part of the house. So we have wood, we have actually um, loaves of bread, and we have wall plaster that covered walls both indoors and out. That wall plaster from Pompeii and Herculaneum, here's another example. You can see we've got great wall plaster almost all the way up and down the wall. This section that's discolored yellow, that shows you the intense heat um, that, that changed the coloring here. But this wall plaster from these two sites has yielded 90% of the decorative wall painting that we have from antiquity. All, almost all of the painting that we have from antiquity is from these two sites. Um, less, so I'll give you just some pretty pictures because we're going to be talking about graffiti. So enjoy these right now. Um, here we have a beautiful wall um, in this nice third style where you've got different, different planes. Um, you've got a tripod up there. Here we have this megalographic, these large scale paintings from the House of the Mysteries, the Villa of the Mysteries. Um, here we have just some of my favorites. We have the myth of Narcissus, who falls in love with his own image and wastes away. Ah, don't be narcissistic, people. So many lessons to learn. And we have this beautiful little detail where we have a Cupid riding on a chariot that's being drawn by dolphins. So Pompeii and Herculaneum, such fabulous stuff. But back to graffiti, here we go. Um, less well known are the writings that these walls also held. Handwritten messages inscribed by individuals capturing the thoughts and voices of the people who lived here. More than 7,000 individual examples have been recovered so far, illuminating a remarkably active mode of communication and a robust community of writing and reading in the first century AD. The Roman Empire has been described as an era characterized by a flourishing epigraphic habit, a rapidly adopted tendency to incorporate text into monuments. These handwritten texts, not even considered in previous calculations because they're not monumental, provide further confirmation of a deeply held interest in the written word and, and crucial insights into Roman culture. The term graffiti was in fact coined in the early 19th century to apply directly to this, to describe these handwritten inscriptions that excavators were finding in the Roman ruins of Rome and Pompeii. So as they were excavating and discovering kind of ancient Roman ruins, they called these graffiti, um, they called these graffi or scratches 
um, because there were scratches on the wall plaster, or little graffiti, so graffiti. That's where we get it. It was only in the second half of the 20th century that this term became more broadly applied to anything on the wall. Still, ancient graffiti have little in common with their modern day counterparts. Ancient examples contain overwhelmingly positive messages. We're not so positive. Um, um, ancient graffiti are small and inconspicuous. I'll show you in just a second. And they are anything but anonymous. So here's one example. Each block here is one centimeter. So we have, it may be hard to see, but we have the name Bucolus. So if someone wrote his name in a really um, refined little hand. If you take a step back, we knew, it was, we knew it was there, we were looking for it. But if you take a step back, you can see how it already fades immediately. And if you take a further step back so that you're more than two feet away, it's pretty much impossible to find ancient graffiti. They are not trying to make their message, make their mark, make a big statement in the way that we think of modern graffiti. So there's something different going on here. So what might someone in first century Herculaneum or Pompeii want to write on a wall? Well, these messages are as individual and heterogeneous as the people who wrote them. So they contain quite a variety of content. Whoops, there we go. Um, this was a friendly medium. Ancient, um, ancient writers wished each, wished each other well. Indeed, it's far easier to find positive messages than negative ones. So here we have Felicitare, may things go happily for Anikia. And you might just start looking around and see that there might be some graffiti in this room. Felicitare, Houstonianis, <laughs> may things go happily and well for the people of, for the people of UH. Um, I know, I tell you, being an archeologist, it's, it, it trains your eye to keep looking for things. <laughs> um, and although in high school Latin classes we might learn to say salve and wale, the graffiti show us that the current way to s in first century, like the cool way to say goodbye in first century was just wa. You don't have to say wa, it's just wa. Bye. Um, other messages record notes and reminders such as the fact that wine was received from the master on a certain date. Still others name favorite athletes, so we have Euhodus and Satura, who are from Puteoli. That was a nearby town that was the port of Italy and a major city in the region. Various cities across Campania hosted gladiatorial spectacles, but Puteoli is known to have held the largest, an event lasting a full week and featuring 49 separate pairs of gladiators. Quotations of poetry were inscribed as well. So this Venomous Hook Cupidi is the first half of a well-known poem that gets written out many times across Pompeii, in Herculaneum, and even written on a wall in a villa in Gaul, or modern day France. So this was, these were popular sayings that were circulating both in written and probably in oral registers. Graffiti in Greek remind us that a number of inhabitants in the Bay of Naples may have been bilingual. And we have examples of philosophy. Uh, so we have a great philosophical library in the Villa of the Papyri, but we can see from these graffiti that it wasn't just people who lived in villas, but people who were in taverns discussing philosophy as well. So this is, he who does not know how to guard himself does not know how to live. And then we have Diogenes, the cynic philosopher, didn't think too highly of women, so we're not even gonna translate that one. But anyway, it's, it's commenting on a philo philosophical school. Um, these handwritten inscriptions can thus provide us a window onto the activities, the discussions, and the daily life taking place in a Roman town in the early empire. So, with ancient graffiti, it's easy to find something of interest. However, since messages are brief, and there are so many scattered across these sites, it's difficult to study them collectively. And so these writings remain mostly unknown, pretty well unknown, despite the potential they hold for studies on Roman society, language use, communication patterns, and even literacy. That's because there's a very high barrier of entry for studying these personalized inscriptions. My ideas in designing the Ancient Graffiti Project focused on lowering some of these barriers to make ancient graffiti more accessible to locate and to study um, 
and more accessible in general. Digital projects are usually built to fulfill some need. In an ideal world, they also offer something more than it's available currently. In my case, I was tapped to supervise re-editing and um, digitally publishing ancient graffiti for the epigraphic database Roma. This is a large initiative to publish electronically all the inscriptions from, of Italy from the 7th century BC down to the 6th century AD in late antiquity. It's a big project, so it has lots of people contributing to it. And I was working with the, the handwritten inscriptions. As I began working, though, I realized that EDR, since it was designed for those 95% of stone inscriptions, it had parameters that didn't quite fit ancient graffiti. So it was asking for information that didn't apply to graffiti, and then it didn't have fields for other rev relevant information that did apply. <coughs> for example, if you're writing on a wall, you might want to know what the height is from the ground level. But a stone inscription, you probably want to know how big the monument itself was. Um, in addition, there wasn't an easy way to gain direct access to graffiti or query only the graffiti. Um, and so AGP was eventually born from some of these ideas. Oops, sorry. So there's EDR. It's fabulous. It now has 76,000 inscriptions in it. Um, we have contributed 1,100 of those. It's pretty good. Not bad. Here we go. So what we've been developing over the past three years is a resource that is linked to the epigraphic database Roma, and it's in fact integrated within EDR. But ours offers additional, different capabilities. It complements the text-based searches of EDR by providing other types of search options that are specific to ancient handwritten inscriptions. And it provides direct access to right now hundreds, but eventually thousands, of these inscriptions, the messages and drawings that the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum wrote, read, and shared with friends. So how, how to create this resource that can do all these things, that improves upon what's available and is user friendly? Well, first we had to surmount some obstacles. So I said that there's some high barriers of entry. Let's consider three of these. Um, three obstacles that at this point impede the study of ancient graffiti. These involve difficulties determining the location of graffiti and therefore anything like distribution patterns or density clusters, or anything like that. Um, the exclusion of non-textual graffiti or drawings and, and an almost total absence of visual illustration. Right now, we can figure out what these things say, but we don't know what they look like because no one has published any pictures of them. These are three areas where we've designed AGP to improve upon current resources and facilitate research queries that are difficult, if not impossible, to pursue at present. One obstacle arises from the fact that these are sites that have been excavated over 200 years, and excavation and publication methods have shifted during that time. This makes a task as simple as determining where a graffito was located quite a challenge. So for some inscriptions, we have locorum in cartorum, so uncertain locations. For some inscriptions, the provenance is lost, as is the case for certain examples that were discovered early on in the excavations that then disappeared before people figured out how, how to write down where they were. For others, the issue is that things have changed. For example, this, uh, here we go, this in the Temple of Venus is not actually the Temple of Venus, it's actually the Temple of Apollo, which is in a different area from what's now called the Temple of Venus. But back then, they thought it was, so we have to correlate that. Um, but there are even bigger changes. So here we have Felix. This is the place. That's cool. Well, what place is it? Ah, it's in tavern number 21. Excellent. So I go to the plan of Pompeii today, and there is no 21. How do I find tavern 21? I want to find the place. Where did Felix think was great? Well, um, in order to do that, you have to turn to the plan that was published with the first run of CIL-4, CIL, the Corpus of Latin Inscriptions, which is the standard reference. That was published in 1871 with a plan that has, um, here we go. With a, here, let's do this. So you can see that here, north is up, and here's the forum, and here's the theater district, right? So this is the current plan. If we look at this plan that was published with CIL, um, it's a little hard to see. Here is the forum. North is now heading to the left. And here's the theater district. 
um, this plan was what they were working with in the late 1800s, and they started numbering, I'm wondering, can you see my little red dot here? Okay, so they started numbering buildings. So here's 50, 51, 52, 53, but not all, number, not, build, not all buildings are numbered, so these just don't have any numbers. And the buildings are not necessarily sequentially numbered. So here we've got 40 to 46 kind of here, but that's kind of 42, and here's kind of 47 and 54. They were doing the best they could. They didn't know how big Pompeii would get. So eventually we came up with another system. Um, you can go to this map and you can correlate where tavern number 21 is up here and find it on the modern system and figure out, oh, tavern number 21 is actually 7213 today. Great. However, just one little minor complication. Um, this plan was no longer printed after the initial run of CIL. So if you purchase the volume after 1940, as my university did, there is no plan to figure out where tavern number 21 is. And it actually is a problem because there are 3,000 inscriptions keyed to that plan that need correlating. So you can see why people might not want to try and figure out distribution patterns. And then there's more, you know. They, they would discover inscriptions <coughs> later and then they're not with the same section of CIL, but they're later. So, so it's possible to look through all 11,000 entries and, and figure out the graffiti from one building. Um, but the task requires time and so very much patience. Enter the Ancient Graffiti Project. Dun, 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 dun. Here we are. Um, we're doing that legwork. Since provenance has the potential to provide so much information about the environment and context of an inscription, our first step is to correlate and determine location. Our next step is to make it easier for people. So we created an interactive, let's see if this works. We created an interactive geo-referenced map linked to our database so that a user can go directly to a building and find all the graffiti that were discovered there. We have forefronted the fact that this spatial information is available by placing maps on the launch page of our, of our AGP and saying in large letters, click on a map to search. So you can click on a map, let's choose Herculaneum, and then you can click on a particular house or a building or multiple buildings and hit search. And wow, I got 65 results in those four buildings. If I say, well, actually, that's neat. That's too much for me to look at. I just want to look at one building. Ta -da! There are 15 results in that particular house, the house of the Grand Portal. So it, it's, it's pretty good, right? It's pretty good. <laughs> um, so we're trying to make it easier, take a big step away so that now we can study these things collectively. Here we go. Another decision we've made is to fully document and digitize not only the texts, but also the drawings that were inscribed on the walls of Herculaneum and Pompeii. This is a step away from the conventions of CIL, which focus squarely on text. A drawing or a non-textual graffito might be mentioned in a side note, or it might go undocumented. So here we have mentioned that this, um, this alphabet is the main inscription that we're interested in. But we also have nine gladiatorial helmets that were drawn nearby on a different wall, but in the same room. As we can see, drawings belong to the same cultural and social activity as the textual messages written on the wall. These figural graffiti or drawings also conform to certain conventions. So heads in profile, boats, and gladiators were popular subjects to draw. So this is, so, so CIL leaves us with this. We have no idea what any of the drawings look like. But we go and look at them and we can see, wow, there's a whole group of gladiator helmets. Uh, we're therefore inserting these drawings into AGP, bringing textual and figural graffiti together into one resource. And we've designed our search engine from the outset to incorporate these two different types of data that are usually kept separate. But since databases are generally predicated on searching for specific text, we had to create a mechanism for the retrieval of images. So how can you look up something like that. Well, what we've done is create several possible routes for someone to search for figural graffiti. So I'm going to take you back 
And here we're going to go. So we're all familiar, we're all comfortable with using words. So if you know the Latin, you can look up the Latin for Galea. And there are 11 entries that have a gladiator helmet right there, right? Um, if you didn't know the Latin word for helmet, well, we have put a translation in here as well. So you could look up helmet. But actually, I'm not going to do that. So you could look up helmet. <laughs> um, and that's great, too. Let me see if I do that. OK. Um, but that kind of searching. So you can search in Latin. You can search in English. But that kind of searching really only works if you already know what's there. So if you, how might you find, for example, a camel? Is there a camel? Why, yes, there is. <laughs> um, it's a camel wearing a blanket with a tail walking to the right. Um, so what we've done is we have devised, we've identified nine broad categories. So you can look up drawing categories, and you can see what kind of drawings there are. And that might help you figure out a different kind of way to search. So that's three. Um, so the nine broad categories. We have also highlighted the fact that figural graffiti are available by making browse all drawings um, uh, big. But one of the, one of the main um, options on the top menu. So that's four. And fifth, we're currently designing one additional mechanism using tags or additional descriptors so that, um, so that you can search uh, different tags that would uh, unite searches and allow more specific searches. These are being developed by the student members of our team right now. Um, and with tags, we aim to create a more flexible and functional way to study this material. So these are two. Oops, oops, let's go back to this. These are two of the things we're doing. A third obstacle that we're trying to um, overcome uh, is the lack of visual illustration. So this is pretty much how you can study ancient graffiti right now. So Pyrrhicus gives greetings to alchemists. Okay, pretty good. But you have no idea kind of what that looked like. Um, illustrations are often restricted in traditional print media due to space, limitations, and cost. But neither of these is a problem in the digital realm. Illustration is something that's been almost completely lacking for ancient graffiti. Up to now, um, graffiti have only been published as TypeScript on a printed page. We have no photographs, we have a few line drawings. So that's clearly another limit to scholarship. Many graffiti have disappeared by this point. But our team has undertaken as one of its main goals to create photographs and line drawings wherever it's still possible to do so. By providing access to the appearance of graffiti and the handwriting each comprises, the personal handwriting, AGP will thereby open new paths of query, especially concerning paleography and the appearance and script of script of these inscriptions. Here we've had one additional challenge in, in doing so, in that graffiti are the cultural heritage of the Italian state. And they require re approval to be used or reproduced. So this is where collaboration helps. We are providing our images. Here we go. We're providing our images to the epigraphic database Roma because they have an agreement with the Ministry of Cultural Heritage. So they can host the images on their website. We add, add a watermark to it. And then we are not hosting it on our website. We're just pointing to them. We're linking to them. So if you want to see what this image looks like, you click on the image and it takes you to EDR. And it tells you, aha, this image comes from the Herculaneum Graffiti Project in 2014. But it says, do not reproduce. Do not reproduce. And this is given by the Ministry of Culture. Here we go. So how did we get here? There's a hint, right? Um, how did we get here? We've come a long way in three years, thanks to these key points that I mentioned earlier. Teamwork, feedback, and collaboration. Teamwork is what got us going and is what's keeping us going. 
I first started testing out ideas for the project with my students. I worked with an advanced Latin seminar that was working on digitizing the inscriptions, and then I worked with a computer science class um, to see if we could develop this a prototype of this search by map feature. If we could figure out a clickable map that would work with inscriptions in a database. So we started with one city block, 14 properties and 64 inscriptions. And here's what that looked like. Here, um, we have one block right over here in Pompeii. You can see how tiny it is. But we got it working. And we said, well, great. Let's move forward with this. But then we looked at Pompeii and said, wow, there are so many city blocks. <laughs> and so we decided, oh, let's go to Herculaneum. There's seven city blocks. <laughs> um, because we also recognized um, that in order to create an accurate and comprehensive resource, we needed better material, better data. And so two years ago, we organized our first field season in Herculaneum. We chose a team of 30 participants, faculty, grad students, and undergrads. Our goal was to record and document as fully as possible the ancient graffiti that remained extant and visible. And our field work consisted of checking locations, taking measurements, making sketches so that we could create line drawings, conferring with teammates about uncertain readings, and taking lots of photographs. Our tools included measuring tapes and meter sticks, LED flashlights, digital cameras, GPS units, and bibliography. When we're in the field, we document traditionally on paper because we want to be able to take notes, make sketches, and important, we want to be able to change things. We want to make changes because we have to revisit locations at multiple points during the day to examine a wall surface under different lighting conditions. In the evenings, we digitized our work, entering notes and discussing what we had found, figuring out what we could read, and discussing where we should look next. Photography. As you've already seen, handwritten inscriptions can be small and faint. They can be hard to find, and they're very tricky to capture in a photograph. The quality of sunlight and shade is crucially important. So LED flashlights can be used to cast a raking light over a wall and find an inscription, but they're not always fantastic for giving you a digital image. So this is one of my ideas. Where is the graffito? Because if you take a, a photograph, you can't see it. So let's put models in there. <laughs> so here, for example, is that uh, piece of plaster with a, just a, taking a regular photo of it. So you can see there's plaster there. If you use an intense LED panel, you can start seeing that some of these um, scratches are coming out. But then you really have to work with it and figure out, how am I going to get the best image? And eventually, you can work with something like this. Um, so it takes a long time to actually photograph an inscription. All the, resorts, all the results and material from our field work are being combined to create as accurate and comprehensive a resource as possible. We are recording when a graffito has perished. We're gathering data that's not included in CIL. We're taking photographs and making line drawings whenever possible. And we're checking every reading, every measurement, every fine spot. So growing, developing and growing a DH project. A main component of digital humanities is collaboration. And teamwork has been fundamental for us. We've been fortunate to have all sorts of teams. So we've had our classics and computer science students. We've had our fieldwork team. Following the fieldwork, teams on different college campuses processed our finds by meeting over bi-weekly Google Hangouts. So every other Friday, we had a Google Hangout. And we worked together. And we were um, developing standards, especially for how we, would, how we would describe these gladiator helmets and other drawings. Um, we have faculty working with students. And I teach at a small liberal arts college, so I don't have any graduate students of my own. But fortunately, we had someone uh, continuing on from our field work. And um, it was a graduate student at Cincinnati. So I could give that graduate student some of the harder questions that would be really difficult for an undergrad to take on and know that these questions were in good hands and were going to be researched thoroughly. So that's been very nice, too. These various teams also mean that we have built-in built in focus groups. So we can ask questions of our students. Does this work? What do you think about this? One of the best ideas that we've built into the project now was uh, uh, an idea that one of our students came up with, saying, 
why don't you come up with something like Amazon does? When you're, sh when you're shopping for clothing and it says you can limit it by what size that clothing is. For us faculty members, that would have never occurred to us. But happily, you all are smart and on top of things. Um, so we built that in and now we have fil filters that actually make this a much more robust um, um, resource. We were also lucky enough to offer um, a seminar at the Center for Hellenic Studies in Washington, D.C. last summer where we provided training on these inscriptions, but we also were able to gain feedback from scholars who were likely to use this resource. So I made them work too. Um, I, and one person is smiling, maybe two. Um, uh, we've had interest as well from high school Latin teachers who, who want to figure out how to use this with their students. So we're going to create a, a panel to work with them next year and um, figure out um, some other ideas that we can implement. Feedback from these different groups allows us to create a project that can be useful at different levels, from students to scholars. Another way we've benefited from feedback is by presenting the project while it's still under development. So I'd encourage anyone who's thinking about a digital project cons to consider different venues to showcase your work and get input from a range of audiences, not just when the project is done, but even as you're still developing it. So we spoke to our own universities. We spoke um, in a digital panel. Uh, we've spoken to people who work with inscriptions. We've spoken to general classicists. Uh, we've spoken to high school teachers. And everyone has given us good ideas about um, little tweaks. So this is a timeline. And you can see that each, each step of the way, we've been growing. So we start with the prototype, and then we go to data collection. Then we start with developing standards after that, that academic year. And then we are gathering <coughs> feedback. We're redesigning. We're starting to incorporate feedback. And then we get to collaboration and integration. Collaboration is something that we have been working on over the past two years. So um, for example, at the end of our field season, we created a list of conservation priorities for ancient graffiti for the Herculaneum Conservation Project, which is a joint effort of the Packard Humanities Institute, the British School in Rome, and the Archaeological Superintendency. We were working with graffiti. They hadn't had a chance to figure out conservation for graffiti yet, and so we provided that to them. We've contributed translations of inscriptions. Um, we there was no copyright-free map of Herculaneum for us to use. There was no map that we could use to put on our site. So we ended up going to OpenStreetMap, which is an open source mapping program. And, oh, OK, I didn't put it in here. It's later. Um, where there were only a few rooms on this map, we created a fully geo-referenced, copyright-free, freely usable and editable, e editable map of Herculaneum. Finally, um, we have recently become integrated within EGLE, the Europeana Network of Greek and Latin Epigraphy. Oh, uh, anyway, we're working with all of these. <laughs> um, so here's EGLE. EGLE is a major initiative of the European Union to create a single portal linking digital projects that have to do with cultural heritage. So you can see this is the main access point to the collections. If we go and look up the content providers here, you can see there are a whole bunch of different projects. So there's the epigraphic database Roma. Here's the epigraphic database in Heidelberg. And down here is the only US project involved in it, the Ancient Graffiti Project. So we're really happy. We just made it in there two months ago. Um, so those are the 459 graffiti that we're ready to share. We've got. 1,100 in process, but we'll get them there soon. So it'll just keep growing and growing. Just a couple of, of last thoughts. So digital humanities is really a new thing. On my campus, it started three years ago with an enlightened dean, an enlightened dean, um, bunch of faculty members with ideas, and beer. And it grew from there. Um, but where do you go if you have maybe ideas and don't know where to start? Well, library and IT staff really seem to be the places where digital humanities expertise is, is being located these days. Colleagues, it's amazing how talking to people and sharing 
ideas and thoughts can really propel things forward. So colleagues are great. Um, in, in the ancient world, we are so fortunate because antiquity started the Homer multi-text project that uh, Professor Duet works on is how many years old? Like uh, 16, 16, I was gonna say more than 15, 16. So talk about early adopter. But this just gives you a sense of how many different projects there are, how many digital projects there are in the ancient world. It's a really exciting place to be. Um, and of course there are conferences and that camp. And I would just say that um, initially, I thought, well, I wonder what I can do because I don't have graduate students. Graduate students you have for a number of years, whereas undergraduates come and go so quickly. But actually, I've created all sorts of wonderful opportunities because I've had great students who wanted to be involved, who were eager to participate. And so I started with these course projects. I was able to create a work study position. We have summer scholars that we can apply for, undergraduate research. And then my colleague at Millsaps College, who's been working with us, was a, had really go-getter students who really wanted to work on the project. And she was able to make one credit independent study courses and have them work on this as the course project. Um, so really, um, you know, undergraduates are this great source of energy and potential. Um, so we're happy to work with and alongside of all of you. Um, lastly, I just want to say that um, you know, I, I'm happy, I'm so happy to be able to talk about our project and talk with people who are interested um, in things like this because we're really trying to create a resource that people will use and that will be useful, that will enable new kinds of research, and that will help in some small way to preserve these fragile historical artifacts that we can't get back um, and that really are fascinating. So, Houstonianis Felicitaer, uh, thanks very much for having me. Dr. Benefield has kindly offered to answer any questions you might have, certainly on, on building a digital project. And you know, we do have an initiative here on campus about integrating more of these projects um, in our work here. Um, but then this is also an ancient topic. So if you have any interest or any questions related to just the graffiti, how the graffiti work, uh, she'll certainly answer anything that, that might come to mind. Yes. Besides the helmets, what's a common uh, pictorial? There are many, many boats because they were right on the Bay of Naples. There are lots of heads drawn in profile. So if you've ever been to Pompeii in the Villa of the Mysteries, um, in the main atrium, there's a little head drawn in profile where there's a man wearing a little laurel wreath. Um, there are a lot of gladiators, gladiators themselves. Uh, we have the House of the Stags where there was, uh, in Herculaneum, there's a House of the Stags because they had um, small statues in the garden of deer. Um, and someone then went into an upper room and started drawing these deer everywhere. Uh, so we have lots of animals, lots of people, lots of um, boats. What about obscenities? Obscenities! <laughs> Parwum fallum, exactly. All right, and this is why we study classics. No. Um, so, so interestingly enough, um, that parwum phallum, that tiny phallus, we couldn't find. We found the gladiator head, so, um, but we found one phallus in, uh, in Herculaneum. In the entire town, there is one left, but it's pretty big, so it's pretty good. <laughs> There's one, so just one, so it's true. Um, it do, we, you know, we are interested in stuff like that, and they were too, but I think we're a little more interested in stuff like that than they were. <laughs> yeah. Yes, great question. So this was one of the things I had to build into, build into AGP because most of them are incised. But we have others that were written with charcoal. And charcoal is really neat because um, you, you take you know, a piece of burnt wood and you can write up here and it's like a pencil because you can erase it just by touching this. So it's amazing that we have any charcoal inscriptions because the minute it rains, that's gone. But I think that shows us that it really wasn't scratching things up. It was just kind of writing things in a small, ephemeral way. So the charcoal, you could erase it. So you could, for example, in charcoal, um, write how much you, pe you spent on food for the day. And sometimes we find those lists with, with kind of the amount of money. 
um, how much cheese cost, how much bread cost. So we have that too. Sometimes they use chalk as well, but chalk doesn't, uh, didn't survive as well. Yes? So it sounds like one of the, this is a nuts and bolts kind of question, so I hope it's not boring, but um, it sounds like one of the things that your project could really contribute to the world among all the many wonderful things you talked about today is um, uh, coming up with the list of canonical citations for the, um, for the graffiti, like so that this will be like a master list that anybody can cite. Um, instead of having all these, having to go back through these crazy publications from the 1800s and, and stuff like that. So it's true. That's a major contribution of your project. Thank you. We're, we're, we're trying to, you know, another thing that you can do in the digital realm is that you can update things much more easily than you can when you're waiting to, to print out a huge folio. Um, so we're trying to, to bring everything together in one place so that you do have a spot where you can start and it saves you all the legwork. That's what we're trying. Thanks. We're getting there. Thank you. Yes? Um, the inscriptions that you have included in the project, is it just the little graffiti, or are you doing the more political messages and things like that as well? We are not working on the painted inscriptions. Um, so, so there are these handwritten ones, and then there are painted inscriptions that are campaign posters for people running for office in Pompeii. And we have about 4,000 examples of those, which are fabulous. Those are, are better studied because they are formulaic. They're talking about people's names who were elite leading citizens. And so more has been done with those. Um, and those are being added to EDR. But at this point, we're working with kind of the, the grittier stuff. Uh, so eventually, if, if we get everything done with, with this section, I do see us potentially expanding. But that's my, that's my optimistic spirit, I think. <laughs> Yes. What software are you using for your graffiti project? Because after sh showing us that, it looked very user friendly, whereas I've seen other projects and they have too many tabs. And it might Thank be you. So what software well, that makes me happy. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'm using my computer science colleague and her students, and that is the software. So we're using different things. Um, oh, I've completely blanked on the image mapping system but I can get get back to you with it but we've we've uh, yeah uh, I'm yeah I'll just I'll just say there <laughs> um, but she thinks that this is a great opportunity for her computer science students because um, they get to interact with a client so rather than just building their own project and figuring out how they want to build a project, they are working with someone who has some ideas but is open to other ideas, and they're figuring out um, how, how to, to work with client services. So we're preparing them for the real world. <laughs> yes? Such an excellent question. What a good research question. So hard to do right now, but soon. It'll be easier, right? Um, no, that, that is a fabulous question. And from, from kind of a, a rough estimate at this point, um, it seems that many larger houses have greater numbers of graffiti. Um, probably because if you're a wealthy person, you're not just going to work and then going home, but your home is your place of business, where you're receiving clients, where you're meeting with friends, and so forth. And so I think there are lots of people coming and going in those larger homes, lots of people having conversations. Um, and the, the smaller homes do have some, but they don't have kind of the, the clustering that you can find in the larger homes. What a great question. Look at that. And you've learned just today about graffiti. <laughs> yeah, yes? Um, as far as like there being good amount of mediums for them to do the graffiti. Is there like a social class kind of thing? Like are, are in the, like the poor neighborhoods, or are they using like charcoal or, or like the richer neighborhoods? Or are they just all kind of combined in that area? Well, so the charcoal we find, um, the charcoal we have to still figure out. If I go back to, oh. Uh, here we, oh, here we go. If I go back here, and let's do browse all inscriptions and writing style. OK, I haven't checked this out. It's still under development. 
OK, so 42. There we go. 42 results found. Um, the charcoal we find often in places like workshops, where people are using graffiti to perform a function. Okay. It's kind of a functional sort of thing. Like a, a workman's kind of Yeah, graffiti. I think so. OK, so, and then like, because there's actual paint that, that yes. was just used for campaigning, but like, there's like birds drawn in paint and stuff. Right, so right. The other thing that I haven't mentioned is that these ancient graffiti really are very careful to never write across any, any, figural, um, any figural decoration. So they'll write it on kind of a smaller section down here where it's not interfering with the beautiful wall painting. Or they'll write it on a wall that's just kind of a, a plain color. Or um, there, are, there are some rooms that were just plain white plaster and you can find more um, messages in there as well. But they're really not, they're really taking care to, um, to respect what's already on the wall. And sometimes even when you find groups of graffiti where they're responding to each other, where someone quotes the Aeneid and says, I sing of arms and the man, and someone else says, well, I sing of the dry cleaners and their hoot owl, <laughs> which we get. Um, when people are, are doing response of graffiti, they're also not writing over what's already there. So here's something, and then here's another one. And sometimes you can see they start writing and realize they're going to run out of space, and then so start somewhere else. Um, so it's a really different means of communication than we have, but they didn't have paper. Um, so this, and as long as it's really inconspicuous, it's amazing how you can walk through these houses. Um, and if I tell you, OK, there are 50 graffiti in this large house, go ahead and find them. Um, it would take a long time to find probably 25 of them uh, because they're just, the houses are so spacious and there's so much decoration that they really kind of blend in. I have another so, question. I, yeah. When you're searching then, are, are you able to divide out these single entries, you know, single names versus more of the dialogue graffiti that you So, see? So what we're trying to do um, is create a possibility so that you get individual returns but you also get information if it's close to other graffiti. And if I try to find one, I'm sure I'll spend too, too long on it. But um, yeah, I'm afraid. Let's, I don't, I don't think there's much uh, charcoal in Herculaneum. Let's see if this one. OK, so this one is not uh, hyper. The link isn't live, but for example, we have um, we have this that's maybe greetings from Moscus to Noethys, and um, so this is one of the things that we need to make a little more user friendly because we have to write a critical apparatus in Latin for EDR. But this is saying that this inscription is below this one inscription and this other inscription, uh, so. That's definitely something that gives you information, but that right now is a little hard to unpack. So we need to find a way to make it more user friendly. But we do have that information that this is close to two other inscriptions. So that if you wanted to try and figure out what was nearby, it's technically possible. Yes. Yes. We have not included the 20th century graffiti. There sadly are 20th century graffiti. And in Herculaneum, when we were working there two years ago, we found something that we weren't quite sure, because it looked like it could be ancient, but then some of it didn't make sense. And I mentioned that we had a Chinese student working with us. Well, we ended up finding this same kind of pattern of letters in several places. And she was able to say, oh, these are two Chinese names. And we found it in a seventh location where it said 2001. Um, so, so if something, uh, we're not rushing to um, publish anything that we suspect might not be ancient yet, uh, because it might be that there's other information can tell us. But sadly, there, there is modern graffiti um, at the site. And often you can pretty easily tell the difference between ancient and modern because modern graffiti is bigger. And they really are writing across wall painting. Um, and they're using things like keys 
so big chunks of plaster is falling off when you do that. So it is a little easier to, but we do have some interesting um, graffiti from the 1940s when the excavations at Herculaneum were being used during uh, bombing in World War II. So we have, so that's, that's historical by now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's a great, that's a, I'm, go into graduate school, or whatever. Just keep that analytical thinking, critical thinking, obviously a liberal arts major. Um, history, way to go. Um, so we do, and the question is how do you, how do you phrase it? So we're saying it's non-standard. So sometimes you have spelling where you can see someone is trying to phonetically figure things out, and of course, um, Latin is a lot easier than English. English, how do you spell something, right? <laughs> but, um, but we have this one fabulous example where someone is trying to write the word quis quis, whoever, whoever, whoever loves, may he be well, whoever does not know how to love, may he perish, may he perish twice over, whoever forbids love. Isn't that great? That's another poem. Anyway, quis quis, and we have someone who clearly is trying to write this, you know, so it's quiz quiz amat. And this gets repeated, this gets written out multiple places. So one place we have, <laughs> quiz quiz amat, quiz quiz. I would like some couscous. No, but it's, it's actually, if you, so we're such visual learners because we're all literate, right? So we can see there's a big difference there. And yet, if you close your eyes and I say quiz quiz, and I cl you close your eyes and I say, kus kus. It's pretty close. It's hard with that Q-U. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard for everyone. Yes? So um, with writing today, like on paper, like my handwriting is crap compared to yes. other people's. Is it the same then? Well, I will tell you that if you were 40 years older and at the age you are, oh, I can't figure out how to do the math. Anyway, um, if you were of an older generation but back at your age, okay you would be able to write, but now we type so much. Right. So even my handwriting was better when I used to write, and now I type. Although that's not too bad. So I had to make it better when I started writing on boards like, again. What I mean is like an ancient. Yes. Like, was it, can you tell like, okay, this calligraphy is different from this one. Like, was, it, was there some where you're just like, what? <laughs> so if, you were to, if I were to skim back through those photos that we have, yes. this is one of the cool things, again, I'm just saying, you all are smart, bright students. This is another one, right, where if it's printed, if it's typed out, right. there's no way to answer that. But if you start looking at it and you see that, you know, au gusto feliciter is written in all caps. Okay. It's capital letters, but when someone writes out poetry, they write it in cursive. Okay. And sometimes, so I, I worked with this one, um, one group of inscriptions that are all writing greetings to a group of women. Um, and there are different hands greeting the same women. There you can see that it's someone who's not very familiar, who's not writing kind of as a daily sort of activity. It's someone who's not familiar with writing. Um, but s other times it is. So definitely the handwriting gives you a sense that some people are, are very comfortable with writing their letters out. Others are just trying right now. Um, yeah, so it, it, is, it really kind of lends these nice textures to, to yeah. looking at who's writing. A, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Although the biographer Suetonius tells us that the Emperor Augustus himself had horrible handwriting because he never had to write. He had people do it for him. <laughs> so. Well, moving forward, I mean, what, what, what are your plans? So, I mean, this is going to take an awful long time, right, and it's yes. very, very necessary work, but is there like a, a digital humanities 2.0 step, you know, uh, I don't know, an analyzing the distribution patterns? Yeah, or, you know, okay. yeah. I really hope that as we, as we put more on, make more available, we can also then start creating maps that people can use. So, so right now you can search pretty much 80% of what's at Herculaneum. So that's not too bad. But when we get all of Herculaneum done, then um, a wonderful, a wonderful um, step would be to, to create maps so that people can look at the, the broader picture. Um, so that is another great idea. Yeah, another step forward. Uh, 
Yes, Bridget. Whenever you find a citation from a poem, uh, you know, in, in the search engine, yes. you record it. And so I, I could, for instance, search for... Uh, Poetry. Right. We can add that. <laughs> please, please. Yeah? We could add that. Yeah. Actually, that's a really great idea. Because there, there is a lot of poetry. Right. I mean, I've just mentioned two of them. Two. I, I mean, I think that would open up all kind of uh, projects. Yeah. Thank you. Great idea. See? Feedback. <laughs> Teamwork. <laughs> Collaboration. Are there any other right. final questions? Yes. Uh, well, uh, it was, was it acceptable to, to, to make graffiti in the house of other people? Like a play got mad. They wouldn't know it. We, we have a lot of graffiti in, in many houses. Um, and so sometimes you, it, it does seem that uh, people are responding to, it seems that there was a conversation taking place on the wall. Um, so it probably makes sense that it's not just the people who were living there who were writing on it, especially because you sometimes get so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so were here. And you probably don't write that in your own house. But then sometimes, sometimes you do get, you know, so-and-so lives here. And maybe someone is writing about, um, about a resident. Um, we also have inscriptions that are commenting on the house owners. So we have um, the, this family that were sponsors for gladiatorial games. And in their house, someone wrote, happy things to this family we wish you well thank you for thank you for hosting games so um, and there is another one where um, where they take this idea and change it to say um, whoever mr. LVP loves may they be well is kind of like a welcome welcome to my house um, but they use the the initials of of presumably the homeowner to say like here's this reference to this poem but I'm gonna use it to say welcome welcome my friends so so we do have that well please join me in thanking Dr. <laughs> <Beth>. <laughs>